Wow, God is so good, so, so good. It's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. You know, this is my house. We're family. Um, I just, I do the same thing but in Spanish in the student center. All right? So we're, we're family. And I'm so rejoiced to be here. And I, I was saying, man, Pastor Ron is inviting me again? I'm not that of a great of a preacher. But I figured out that he likes my accent. So I think, so that, I think that's why I'm here today. <laughs> Truly, I'm here by God's grace, the same, the same reason why I'm saved, by grace. Um, and it's a true joy uh, to be in the house of the Lord. How many of you are ready to hear from the Lord this morning? Because he already started t- talking to us. He, he started already to speak to our lives. And I, I want to invite you to go with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to consider uh, chapter 24. And we're going to be reading from verse 9 to 14. Amen. So the servant took an oath by putting his hand under the thigh of his master, Abraham. He swore to follow Abraham's instructions. Then he loaded ten of Abraham's camels with all kinds of expensive gifts from his master. And he traveled to distant Aram Naharaim. There he went to the town where Abraham's brother, Nahor, had settled. He made the camels kneel beside a well just outside the town. It was evening, and the women were coming out to draw water. Oh, Lord, God of my master Abraham, he prayed, please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master Abraham. See, I am standing here beside this spring And the young women of the town are coming out to draw water. This is my request. I will will ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. If she says, yes, have a drink. And I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have selected as Isaac's wife. This is how I will know that you have shown unfailing love to my master. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your awesome word. Thank you, God, because you are interested in blessing us and guiding us and giving us instruction. And, Lord, we open up our hearts. We open up our minds. We open up our spiritual ears to listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is such an interesting story that we just read, and there is absolutely nothing like this in the scriptures. Nothing else like this story. No, no engagement process like this process right here of how did they got uh, this wife for for Isaac? And you know, when I read stuff like this in the scriptures, um, I don't know if this happens to you, but sometimes I, I just sort of feel like God might be Hispanic, you know. <laughs> And, and let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. You know, sometimes you're reading something in, this, in, the, in the Bible, right? You're reading the scriptures. And, and you're like, wow, that was so awesome. Man, that's touched my heart. And then you read the same verse in Spanish. And you go like, whoa, that was profound. What, what is, whoa. You know, and you, because we got all those double R's, you know, and that fancy pronunciation that Spanish has. But there is a particular verse in this passage that really, really touches my heart. And I want to share that with you today. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bilingual thing. Is that okay with you guys? Can we do a little bit of Spanish here? All right. So I'm going to read to you in Spanish and in English because I want you to, to, to see what I'm reading as I read it in Spanish. Verse 13 says, Aquí me tienes. Here you have me. A la espera, waiting, junto a la fuente, beside the fountain. Here you have me, waiting, beside the fountain. Hmm, pretty interesting, huh? You know, fountains and springs have, have always been very important to create cities, to build cities, because it determines the livelihood of, of everything there. It gives life, right? So when they were building cities in biblical times, they would, they would try to find where there were fountains and wells and springs to build a city there. You know, the word for fountain used here is the word N. And the prefix N has been used to name many cities, like the city of En Gedi. So fountains, water, springs are very important because it symbolizes in the word of God purity. 
It symbolizes healing. It symbolizes freshness. It symbolizes life. It symbolizes refreshment and, and, and fertility and blessing. So it's pretty important to pay attention whenever we see this in the scripture. And, you know, we have many references in the Bible about water. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says that in the beginning, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. In fact, Jesus says that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. And as Christians, we, we show our faith and our commitment to follow Jesus and to live for him by being baptized in the water. So it is very important. And when, when we look at this passage and we see that he's not only there, but he is beside it. He, he's not yet tasting of the water. He's there, but he's just beside it. And I don't know you, but I, I believe that task, that responsibility that Abraham's servant had was huge. I mean, look at the oath he made. Finding a wife for the son of the promise. That's huge. And then carrying all those gifts, he probably took some risk of having some burglars and being assaulted. Who knows? Who knows what could have happened? It, it must have been something difficult. And I just keep imagining this because he traveled a journey of 600 to 700 miles at the speed of a camel. You know, camels are great animals to travel, right? Not in this time, because I would prefer an airplane, of course. But, but back then, back then, they were strong. They were resistant. They were great for desert. But they were slow. You got it, sister. They were, they were slow. They could go from 25 to 30 miles per day. That's slow. It took him three to four weeks to get there. So probably he did stop at Chick-fil-A. Who knows? But I, I'm sure that he was genuinely thirsty. I think his camels needed some water. He got there, but he couldn't taste the water yet. And I don't know if that's your situation today. I don't know if you are close to a blessing and the Lord has spoken to your life. And you know that he gave you something, a word, a promise, something. And you are you're close, but, but nothing yet. And you're waiting and waiting in the Lord. And if God said it, you know, you better believe it because he keeps his promises. But it feels like nothing else is happening. And it's just time to wait. Here you have me waiting beside the fountain. As a therapist, I know that waiting is difficult for human beings. It's very difficult. I get that question all the time. What am I supposed to do as I wait? You know, you know why it's difficult? It's difficult because the outcome of the process determines the next steps. And, and if there's no process, you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do next. It's difficult. It's difficult because not knowing or not seeing what you've been waiting for gives us a sense of pause. And feeling stuck, it, it's, it's a little bit yucky at times. It makes us feel that we are in pause. We're like wondering, Lord, what's, what's going on? And also because humans crave uh, assurance. We crave assurance. We want to know. But if the Lord spoke... But if he gave you a promise, but if you are waiting on the Lord, not on the government, not on the pastor, not on your spouse, not on your kids, not on your boss. If you are waiting on the Lord, you will taste the fountain. You will get there. You will taste from the fountain. And there are seven keys that I have learned from this story, and I want to share that with you. They come handy as we wait upon the Lord and the first key is found in chapter 12 of this story. And it says, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, he prayed. Please, please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master Abraham. 
This man in the midst of waiting, as he was waiting on God, he learned that if he talked with God, his faith and his hope would develop. And as you are waiting in God, you need to pray. You can't stop the praying. You can't say, oh, you know what? This is just too much. I'm just going to give up. No, 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 no. Keep talking to God. Continue the conversation because that's going to make your faith grow. That's going to give you hope. We learn Hebrews 11.1. 1, right? Faith is the substance of the things hoped for. The evidence of the things not seen I want to I do a little bit more Spanish. Is that okay? A little bit more? That same verse. La fe es la certeza de lo que se espera. I'll say it in English. Faith is the assurance of the things we are waiting for. Waiting for. Faith is developed as we pray. You know, we talk a lot about faith as Christians. And we should. We should talk about faith. But hope is very important too. That's why 1st of Corinthians says that there is no greater thing than faith, hope, and love. Hope is very important. You know the Spanish word for hope is esperanza. Have you heard that word before? Esperanza. It's a nice name too, right? Esperanza. Hope. And esperanza comes from the verb esperar, which means to wait. To wait. So if you look in Spanish for the word esperanza, you will find that it says to wait with optimism. Pretty cool, right? Do not wait with sadness. Wait with joy. Do not wait with resignation. Wait with positivism. Do not wait with defeat. Wait with faith. Do not wait with fear, but with confidence and peace, knowing that God is on your side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Give the hand. Happy for the Lord. Hallelujah. Hand off for me. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So as you are waiting on God, pray so you may develop your faith, your faith and your hope. Key number two is on verse 10 and 11. He took with him 10 of Abraham's camels loaded with samples of the best of everything his master owned and journeyed to Iraq to Nahor's village. There he made the camels kneel down outside the town to rest beside a spring. There are two things that the Lord wants you to do as you wait. The Lord wants you to cast your burdens and rest. You see, these camels were carrying a lot of weight for a long time. And perhaps you're doing the same thing. Perhaps you've been carrying with stuff for so long, and God is telling you today, cast your burdens and rest and rest. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, sometimes as Christians, we say, yeah, I'm going to, I trust the Lord, but I got to, you know, because my, you know, my daughter is, a, it's a, you know, she has some issues, and, and I, I, I trust the Lord, but, you know, I got I to gotta deal with all this stuff. And the Lord is asking us to cast our burdens, to trust him on this. Hallelujah. And we come to church and Pastor Ron gives a great sermon and we go like, yeah, I'm going to trust you, Lord. And we, you know, we cast our cares around here somewhere. And then the service is over and we go like, oh, yeah, 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 because I got to take this back home. Because, you know, last time I, you know, I was on my, I've been living from paycheck to paycheck. It was supposed to be from glory to glory, right? But. And we take our burdens back home. This man didn't lay two camels or, or seven. He laid his ten camels that were carrying a lot of stuff and made them rest. 
What are the things that you have to rest in the Lord? What are the areas of your life that you've been trying on your own strength? I love this psalm, Psalm 55, 22. Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. The Lord is asking you to cast your burdens and rest in him. So speak to your soul and, and say, cast your burdens. Rest in God's faithfulness. Here you have me. Waiting beside the fountain. Church, as you wait, pray. Church, as you wait, cast your burdens and rest. There's a third key that I want to share with you. And this one is found in verse 11. The same one. There he made the camels kneel down outside the town to rest beside a spring. Among the gifts he made many, he had many jewels and valuable clothing. He made the camels kneel down. And that talks to me about humbling ourselves before God. If you are waiting on God, it's a good moment to humble yourself before the Lord. It's a good time to search to see if there's any wicked ways within you. It's a good time to see if there's anything that smells like pride. Oh, I got this. Yeah, my ministry and my talent and my, you know, I got a raise and I have a bonus and I don't know what. Is there any attitudes? Is there any way that we're talking to the people we supervise at work or the people that work with us or our spouses or children? And we're being prideful. God is asking us. To humble ourselves. Verse 52 in that same story says, When Abraham's servant heard these words, he knelt down before the Lord until his forehead touched the ground. If you are waiting upon the Lord, humble yourself. Every day if necessary. Tell him, Lord, I recognize where you are and where I am. Lord, I recognize your magnificence. First of Peter, chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Church, he cares for you. He knows what you're going through. He understands. And he cares. Here you have me. Waiting beside the fountain. And as you wait, pray. As you wait, cast your burdens and rest. As you wait, humble yourself before the Lord. The fourth key. We find it in verse 21. Meanwhile, Abraham's servant watched her in silence. To see if the Lord had crowned his journey with success. You know what? Sometimes while waiting, we have to make some silence. We have to silence those voices that intimidate our faith. Those voices of deceit. Those voices of confusion. Those voices of, of lies from the enemy that tells you it's too complicated. It's, no, it's just too late. It's too difficult. Forget about it. No. Those are lies from the enemy. Those voices of shame, of guilt, of lack of confidence. But in order to do that, sometimes we have to pay attention where these voices are coming from. Is it coming from somebody that you should have not been having in, their, in your circle? Is it someone that you have to put a boundary and say, okay, that's it. You know, you were cool for a while, but, you know, I can't hang out with you anymore. Are they being uttered, perhaps, from your own lips? Have you been declaring over your life stuff that God has not declared? Have you been, have you been speaking to your life things that God has not spoken? Have you been saying things to your kids when you're upset that you shouldn't? 
and that hurts God's heart? We got to review ourselves. We got to check us. We got we to take a look in the inside. God speaks life, not death. We have the power of life and death in our tongue. Psalm 37, 7 says, Be silent before the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Stop trying to do it yourself. Hey, um, the Holy Spirit job is already taken. So stop applying for it. Stop trying to convince people of stuff. Let him do the work. Amen. So as you wait, pray, cast your burdens, humble yourself, and once in a while, make silence. Key number five. It's found also on verse 21. Meanwhile, Abraham's servant watched her in silence to see, to see if the Lord had crowned his journey with success. He watched in silence to see. As you are waiting on the Lord, he wants you to be ready to see stuff. As you are waiting in God, he wants you to see what he is doing. Not, with, not so much with your physical eyes, but with your spiritual eyes. So you could speak to your life, to your circumstance, what you are seeing in the spirit. You see, that's why we need to pray. Because if not, we're disconnected. We cannot see in the spirit. So look beyond your situation. See what God is doing and listen to what he is saying. Because God is always speaking. We just need to tune our ears to what he is saying and to his frequency. Psalm 85, 8. I will listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying. For he speaks peace to his faithful people. God speaks peace to your life at this moment. Can you receive it? He is speaking peace to you at this time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, speak to us. God wants you to know that he speaks a word of peace to your soul. Here you have me waiting beside the fountain. Don't forget to pray. Don't forget to cast your burdens and rest. Humble yourself. Make silence if it's necessary. See and listen to what God is doing because it's something beautiful. There's another key that I want to share with you. Key number six. And this key is found on verse 54, they already spoke to Rebecca and to her family. They're in the house already. Look what it says. Then they ate their meal, and the servant and the man with him stayed there overnight. But early the next morning, Abraham's servant said, send me back to my master. But we want Rebecca to stay with us at least 10 days. Her brother and her mother said, then she can go. But he said, don't delay me. The Lord has made my mission successful. Now send me back so I can return to my master. Hey, this guy traveled for three to four weeks. I mean, 10 days would have come handy. Why not? Right? But let me tell you something. When you're waiting on God, he renews your strength. He gives you new strength. He gives you new power. Hallelujah. So as you wait on the Lord, receive new strengths from God. Receive new strength from the Lord. Hallelujah. If you're feeling tired, if you're feeling overwhelmed, or if simply if you feel like this waiting has taken forever, be assured that God gives you new strength. God gives you new strength. Isaiah 40, 30 to 31 says, Young men get tired and need to rest. Even young boys stumble and fall. But those who wait 
upon the Lord will become strong again. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weak. They will walk and not get tired. He gives you new strength. Here you have me, waiting beside the fountain. So let's pray. Let's cast our burdens. Let's humble ourselves. Let's make silence. Let's see and listen. Let's receive new strength from the Lord. And the last key that I want to share with you, it's found on verse 26 and verse 27. The man bowed low and worshipped the Lord. Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, he said. The Lord has shown unfailing love and faithfulness to my master. For he has led me straight to my master's relatives. In your waiting time, be grateful and worship. Be grateful and worship. You know, the choir sounds beautiful. The worshipers, they inspire us when they sing, right? It's just so beautiful. But sometimes they come up here with brokenness. Sometimes they, they step up here and, and they're all, you know, excited and all that stuff. But sometimes they go through rough stuff, just like you. But he continues to be holy. He continues to be worthy. So even though you're waiting and even though you're so close and you, you just can't grasp it yet, still be grateful and worship him. Thank him because he sustains you. Thank him because he's doing stuff right now, right here. Thank him because he has provided. Thank him because he, he keeps his promises. Psalm 52 verse 9 says, Oh God, I will always thank you for what you have done. I will wait on before you, before your faithful people, because you are good. Psalm 42 11 says, why am I going to be discouraged? Why would I be worried? I have put my hope, mi esperanza, my hope in God, whom I still continue to praise. He is my God and my Savior. Psalm 71 verse 14 says, but I will wait at all times. I will praise you more and more. <laughs> Make, may your waiting time make you want to worship him more. <laughs> may your waiting time make you want to thank him more. May your waiting time make you want to praise him even more and thank him even more and worship him even more. <laughs> because you are closer to what he said you will receive. You know, the end of the story calls my attention so much because... After traveling for four weeks, verse 62, 63, and 4 says, Isaac returned from the well. What a coincidence, huh? From the well. Called, he who lives and sees me, for he lived in the south region. He went out to meditate in the field in the evening. Then he saw that some camels were approaching. Rebecca also looked. And when she saw Isaac, she got off the camel. Isaac was beside the water. Rebecca was found beside the water. <laughs> the place of your waiting is often the place where your blessing will appear. Right here, as you are waiting, God is already doing stuff. God is actually blessing you right now. He's forming you. You're not the same person six years ago. <laughs> right? You're, you're not the same person six months ago. Because <laughs> he's doing it. He's working in you.